said, my name is Dr. Sammy Inman. Um, I'm a dentist and I teach at the special care clinic at the dentistry School of Dentistry and Oral Health here in Arizona through AT Still University. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can see the slides come up here. All right. <clears throat> So um, here at AT Still, we see a good number of patients with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, for routine dental care and almost any kind of treatment with or without sedation. If there is one thing that I've learned while doing this, it's that there is no one size fits all way to treat this population of individuals when every person with ASD is so unique. As most of you are aware, being in a dental office poses many unfamiliar experiences all at once that can aggravate almost every single sensory system. From the minute you walk in, almost all of your senses are stimulated from the lights, the sounds, the noises, and the unique sensations of our tools and instruments like the suction and the tools that we use to clean your teeth. I'll be honest with you, these aren't considered pleasant for anyone, whether neurotypical or neurodivergent, and because of it, uh, this can often lead to avoidance of dental care due to fear and anxiety. I'm here with you all today to talk about what to expect, what you can do to prepare for an upcoming dental visit, and tips for success with caring for your teeth at home. So full disclaimer, um, I received no endorsements from or have any affiliations with any of the mentioned products or services and the views that I express are entirely my own and are not representative of the university as a whole. So where to start? Um, finding a dentist. As you all probably know and have experienced, finding a dentist who is able and willing to treat people with autism spectrum disorder can be really challenging. Historically, and still we often see today that many patients with special health care needs were referred to pediatric dentists. Um, but there are many differences between children and patients with special needs, uh, and the two disciplines really should be treated as such. And this is why we, uh, as a special care, kind of branched out into its own little niche. It's not currently a recognized dental specialty at this time but there are many different organizations that support and guide providers who are willing and passionate about treating this population. Um, some of those include the Special Care Dentistry Association, also known as SCDA, or the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, also known as the AADMD. Today, a majority of patients are still being seen in pediatric offices, but we hope to see this diverge more and more over the years. The reason for this is that many dentists who were surveyed said that the issue was that they didn't feel they were properly trained to treat the population. Um, but fortunately, as of recently, it's become a requirement for dental schools, all dental schools, to train future dentists in becoming competent in treating patients with disabilities. So uh, I really do hope to see access to dental care among this population only improve in the distant future. However, until then, uh, pediatric dentists are still the primary route for most children and some adults with special health care needs. No matter what type of area you live in, uh, one of the best ways to find a good dental provider that is comfortable with treating both children and adults with ASD is through word of mouth, as you probably have heard. Uh, if you or your child or your loved one with ASD attends any sort of day program, special Olympics, or locally supported activities for people with ASD, uh, or even Facebook groups or any other ASD-friendly communities, there's a good chance that someone at one of these events might be able to give you a good recommendation for a dentist that they go to or that sees their adult or their child. We do have a pretty strong presence at the Special Olympics where you can receive free dental screenings and uh, potential referrals to providers in your area. This is one advantage to getting your child well integrated into the community and finding other like-minded individuals who can support you in finding not only the right dental provider, but this also applies to medical providers as well. 
The link that I have pasted on the slide is from a website called Autism Speaks, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard of that has different dental and medical providers listed who uh, treat patients with ASD, and it may or may not be a useful resource to you depending on where you live. Uh, if you live in a larger, well-connected kind of metropolitan or city area, uh, one pretty obvious thing to do is just search special care or special needs dentist in your area. And if you have a dental school within driving distance, you can call and ask if they have a special needs clinic. Um, and it could be that we'll see a lot of these schools popping up special needs clinics in the near future. So if they don't have one now, uh, they may be getting one in the future just due to the change in the requirement. But currently not all dental schools do, unfortunately. And um, you may have to commute a ways to get to the right place to treat your child. Even in a busy area where we are outside of Phoenix here, uh, we have some patients who drive three or more hours just to come and see us because getting the specialized care that they need is worth the commute. And if you are driving along dentist, or excuse me, if you are driving a long distance, you can ask your dentist to schedule you for longer appointments so you can try to get more done in one visit if you feel that you and your child can tolerate the long appointments. Uh, otherwise, we do try to keep appointments to short time frames just to make sure that uh, we can get a lot done in a little bit amount of time without um, the child or the patient getting exhausted or um, squirmy. But that is an option if you have to commute a long ways. Um, and there are different uh, ways that we can make that more tolerable that I'll talk about later on in the lecture. If you live in a remote area or if you've tried any of the above things that we've mentioned and you still haven't found a dentist, you may just need to find a dentist or a pediatric dentist near you that you can trust and teach them how to treat you in a sense. Any dentist you go to is going to know how to fix your teeth, but Autism presents differently in each person. So everyone's needs and accommodations in the dental chair are gonna to be totally different from one another. It doesn't take a specific special care dentist to take care of your child's teeth. It just takes a dedicated team with the heart and the willingness to go the extra mile for their patients. And we can talk about some examples of some of the accommodations that we make or provide for our patients with ASD in our dental clinic here in Mesa later on in the lecture. So you found your dentist and you've made your appointment and now it's time to get ready for it. There are several things that you can do that may be helpful for your child. Keep in mind that just because some of these things have worked for our patients in the past doesn't necessarily mean that they'll work for you or for your child with ASD. Uh, one thing that we have some patients, more so for younger children that are starting out on brushing is uh, we'll have them come and pick up a pair of gloves ahead of time, or you can just buy them in the stores or on Amazon, but um, similar latex or nitrile gloves that like we use in the dental office. And um, you just give your child a gum massage with the gloves on, and then that can get the child used to the sensation of having gloved hands in their mouth because if you're helping your child brush at home, uh, my guess is that you're not wearing gloves if you do it while you do it. And if you do, uh, great, then you're already ahead of the game. But just kind of that sensation of getting gloved ha hands in the mouth, having someone else's fingers in your mouth um, can sometimes be helpful in preparation because then it's not all so unfamiliar when it, they get time to get to the dentist. So here's a video example of that. Today I'm going to show you how to do gum massage. And I have a little helper with me today. Take your gloved hand and just start in the upper central. And I just go across the arch of the gum all the way to the back, go about three times. Then I go to the bottom, go across about three times. And then I switch to my thumb. And I go about three times. And then I go up to the back of the upper right, go over along the archway and out. All right, did that feel good? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Okay, thank you for swallowing. We can start again. So it's one, two, three, go down. One, two, three, switch over. One, two, three, and up. One, two, 
three, and that's it. And I like to do three sets. Now can what? I do that? Um, now, now what do I have? One more time for the people, okay? Can you sit back a little bit? One more time. Ready, then we'll be done. One, two, three. One, two, three. Switch over. One, two, three. One, two, three. And you're done. Sometimes what I would like to do too is if you can't get in the mouth, if you can just do it along the gum line here to get them used to that feeling, that would be good too. So you could do this. The gum is sticky. Yes, they're sticky because they're a little wet. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, and then hopefully you'll be able to get inside. Really gets a lot of oral input yeah. inside, and we're done. You want to press that button? Say goodbye to everybody. Say bye. So um, the idea is more so for uh, sensory tolerance. And the more you do it, the more your child will get used to it and the better they'll be able to tolerate us going and feeling in with our instruments and our gloves. Um, and after the third pass, he kind of started to enjoy it. So uh, it's not going to go like that for every single kid, but um, I do want to point out and have you all appreciate how she doesn't go toward or beyond the biting surfaces of the teeth. She more so just stays in the cheek and on the outside uh, and this is very important because you don't want to risk uh, getting your fingertip bit. A lot of times, you know, they're not aware if they're biting you and they're just kind of paying attention to all of the sensations. So try to stay on the outside of the teeth within the cheek uh, and avoid going in between the biting surfaces of the teeth. It's just best to take every precaution. So some helpful supplies that you can purchase. Uh, because every patient is different. These are just some items that have worked for some of our patients. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to work for you or your child, um, but there is a list of, of things that have really helped our patients here. So noise canceling headphones. Um, now we have AirPods are becoming a thing and they have the noise canceling feature. Uh, those are really comfortable and really small and discreet. And a lot of our patients like that. Um, so you could get the big noise canceling headphones if you have those, or even just standard headphones for music. Sometimes that can be calming for the patient. Um, sunglasses, we keep those in each of our operatories because the bright light can be really overwhelming. Um, but if you want to just take an extra precaution, you can pick up a set of sunglasses at the dollar store in case your dental office has only clear glasses. Uh, then you can bring those darker glasses if you're concerned about the brighter light. Fidget toys seem to be a pretty big success <clears throat> among our population or Rubik's cubes, just something to kind of distract the brain from all of the over sensory stimulation that's going on in your environment. Weighted blankets go a long way. Um, there are various dental kits available in retail stores and online. I do not suggest taking any sharp instruments to your child's mouth, but you can use the mirror to get your kid used to having a mirror in their mouth before the dental visit. So um, gloved hands and just practicing having that mirror and the whole sensation of it can be really helpful. Um, and then it's also a good idea to bring a phone, a book, iPad or crossword puzzle or whatever it is that you like to do. Uh, just because like most doctor's office, occasionally there can be a little bit of waiting time. Most dental offices have set appointments, but then uh, they kind of roll on a rollover cycle and occasionally one procedure may take a little bit late, which may offset the whole appointments for that day. Um, so you can potentially call your dental office ahead of time, uh, you know, before you're supposed to leave and just see how they're doing as far as time goes, if there's going to be any wait time. And then sometimes uh, you can ask to wait in your car until they're ready to bring you back, or you can uh, wait in the waiting room with the different books, crossword puzzles, or sometimes they'll have different TVs or movies playing. Uh, again, it just depends on your individual child and what, what will work best for them. So what can you do to prepare for your visit as the patient? Um, bringing anything that brings you com comfort can be helpful. So toys, stuffed animals, blankets, 
Um, some people have comfort water bottles, you know, shoes. I don't care what it is. Um, but the idea is that it's just bringing a sense of familiarity from home and bringing that to the dental office. It's not a bad idea to let the dental office know if you're bringing anything um, just so that that way they can kind of incorporate it into the visit. Like if your child has a particular stuffed animal that they really love, um, then we can kind of add that into the visit and use the stuffed animal to demonstrate different brushing techniques on if the child will allow us to do that. Um, so we have a lot of options here. A tight fitting shirt. Now I'm sure this one got a lot of attention. Why a tight shirt? Well, some psychologists theorize that it can kind of act like a weighted blanket where it provides somewhat of a hug like feeling and it can bring a sense of comfort to the patient. Um, now we've also had people on the opposite end of that who want to be wearing as loose of clothing as possible. I'm talking full out pajamas. If this makes you feel comfortable, it is perfectly fine with me. I don't need you dressed up to come in. As long as you're comfortable, um, that's probably what's best. So um, it's also a good idea to just focus on, through the duration of the appointment, focus on keeping your hands on your belly, taking deep breaths and keeping your, wide, your mouth wide open and your legs kind of straightened in the chair. And by focusing on those physical things in your environment, um, it can significantly help you uh, be able to get through the dental visit. So as parents or caregivers, what can we do? Um, and no negative preconceived notions. So what do I mean by preconceived notions? Please do not instill your own personal fears of the dentist onto your children or use coming to the dentist as a threat or a punishment in any way. Um, I, like we, sometimes we hear, you have to go to the dentist where they're going to scrape on your teeth and poke you with needles because you were a bad kid. Um, that's not the affiliation that we want them to think. It's not a punishment. Uh, we, as in the field of dentistry, we've come a long way since the little shop of horror days. So uh, please don't create that fear and resistance around your children before they even know what to expect. Um, the field of dentistry has made a lot of improvements in product quality, medicine, and technology over the years. And dental visits today are meant to be virtually painless. Um, we inform, we do not ask. So that applies to both what we do in the dental office and what you can do for your child or your loved one with ASD. Um, for example, we don't say, do you want to go to the dentist? It's, we are going to the dentist today. What flavor tooth polish are you going to pick? Or where are you going to pick to go out to eat after? That way your child is getting a choice in something, but not necessarily controlling the non-negotiables, which can affect how the appointment goes. And we tend to run the appointments as such. And we also utilize a tell, show, do approach. The appointment checklist. Uh, you guys may or may not have heard about this, but people with ASD tend to do really well with a schedule and a list that they can follow off of. So your dental team and your dental provider, it doesn't take a specific special care dental team to do this kind of thing, but um, maybe just at the beginning of your appointment, um, asking what do we intend to do today? And your provider, your hygienist, dentist, or the dental assistant that's helping can give a list of items that they intend to do. So if you're coming for a routine cleaning visit, oftentimes it's x-rays, cleaning of the teeth, flossing of the teeth, the exam portion with the dentist, and then you'll probably do some practice brushing at the end. Um, and then the desensitization appointment, I guess I kind of flopped those two. I apologize about that. But um, this is a really important one for patients with ASD. It's often used as kind of a practice visit before the first appointment to familiarize oneself with the dental environment, the people in the dental office, and all of the instruments and if it is the right office, they will be willing to schedule this extra practice visit for you um, just to familiarize your child with everything that we have to offer. So now the time has come, you've done all of your prep work and it's time for your first dental visit. Um, here is a tour of something similar to what you'll see in most dental offices throughout the country. The dental operatory. So. Um, you have a standard dental operatory set up here with the overhead light, 
the dental chair that reclines back and forth. Uh, and then there will often be two chairs or one chair, depending on what type of appointment you're getting. Um, and then we have our various suction and water modalities on the other side of the chair here. So a mirror and explorer, these are two things I would expect to encounter at almost every single dental visit. Um, we use the mirror to look around your mouth in the hard to see places. Uh, and it just kind of helps move your cheeks and everything out of the issue or out of the way so that we can see your teeth. And the Explorer, although it looks sharp, we only use this on the hard surfaces of your teeth to check for cavities. We don't use it on your gums or anywhere pokey. You shouldn't feel anything sharp um, and your teeth don't feel that fine little point on there. So um, you shouldn't be worried about anything sharp involving that, but that's why we have you wear protective eyewear is just because we're feeling around such small crevices uh, and we just don't want you know anything to slip or you move and anything hurt your eyes. So um, we also have the air water syringe. The picture on the left is what we use to spray air and water in your mouth to clean off your teeth. Um, we call it an air water syringe, or as I affectionately like to refer to it as my squirt gun. And on the right, we see the suction that you'll spit any extra water, toothpaste, or saliva into throughout your appointment. Um, and if you'd like, if it helps give a sense of control, we can actually hand you the suction and you can be in control of when you spit uh, or when you feel you need to suck up any extra water in your mouth while we're working. Sometimes uh, just allowing the patient to control that can um, be really helpful for the appointment. And like I said earlier, just kind of focusing on keeping your hands on your stomach, holding your mouth open and holding your legs out straight can kind of help to help as another distractor for everything that's going on. Um, here we have a video. This was actually put together at our university by my colleague and mentor, Dr. Miley Duong, with the intention being to create a virtual desensitization visit for our patients during COVID when we were trying to limit visits and then therefore exposures. So we'll just take a second to watch this video. Going to the dentist can be a scary thing. Sometimes knowing what will happen ahead of time can help. This video will show you what a visit to the dentist will be like. After you drive to the dental office and park, you'll walk into the dental office. Sometimes it may be inside a big building like this one. Sometimes it can be on a different level and you'll need to take the stairs or elevator. When you enter the dentist's office, you'll check in at the front desk by giving the staff your name. Then you'll take a seat and wait for your name to be called. When the dentist is ready for you, the dental assistant will call out your name. The dental assistant will walk you into a room where you will sit in a comfortable chair. Once you sit down, the dental assistant will measure your pulse and blood pressure using an arm cuff that hugs your arm tightly. When you meet the dentist, you will spend time talking about yourself, your health, and your questions. We encourage you to complete a positive personal profile worksheet and a My Dental Appointment worksheet ahead of time. These worksheets will help you have a good conversation with your dentist. Next, you're ready to begin the exam. The dentist will wear a special mask and funny glasses. You will also get to wear a pair of glasses too. The dentist will use special instruments to count your teeth and check your gums you'll need to open wide for the dentist to look inside your mouth. The dentist will also feel around your head and neck for lumps or bumps. It will feel like a massage. The dentist will take some digital x-rays. You will get to wear a heavy blanket called a lead apron. And all you have to do is bite down on the tab, stay still and smile. If you're lucky, the dentist may also take photos of your teeth to see them better. The dentist will sometimes use metal retractors to hold your cheeks out of the way to see your teeth better. Don't worry, it doesn't hurt at all. After you're all done, you'll get a high five from your dentist and you're on your way home. Great job, see you next time.
So that's something that we use for our specific clinic because um, that was made here in house at our ASDO dental clinic. Um, it's not likely that most of the clinics you'll go to will have a specific desensitization video like we have, uh, but there are generic dental desensitization videos available all over the internet on YouTube. If you just kind of search that, you can find this same video uh, or a handful of other videos of a similar respect that can just kind of introduce you to what to expect in a dental office and what we're going to do. Going to the okay. dentist can be a scare. So um, don't be afraid to speak up or ask for accommodations in the office. Like a person with ASD, no two dental offices are the same and some offices may or may not be equipped to accommodate your request, but it never hurts to ask. Um, private operatories, a lot of dental offices have this for different surgeries or for patients that require um, just their own operatories. That's definitely something that you can ask for. And then you can just kind of close the door and minim minimize any outside distractions. You can ask to limit the number of people in the room in a private dental office or a private practice, this isn't usually a problem, but in a dental school setting, you could have up to three or four people in the room at any given time. So all you really have to do is ask for less people and they should be able to accommodate. Um, turning the lights down, um, not all offices have the ability to do this just to their electrical circuitry and not all dentists have headlamps, but a good number of offices and clinics and dentists should have this ability. I would say a majority nowadays should have a headlight um, and you should be able to just turn the lights on and then that headlamp will be the only thing illuminating the mouth and then the patient can just kind of relax and it's as if they're going to bed. Um, waiting in the car, I know we touched on this a little bit earlier, but if it's more comforting for you, you can certainly request to wait in the car and just have them call you when they're ready to bring you back. And more and more people are able to accommodate to this in a post-COVID era. Before it was a little harder, but now a lot of people will, should be able to accommodate to this. Uh, we had talked earlier about the appointment checklist. That's another thing that can help. Um, or shorter appointment times for patients who have difficulty tolerating longer appointments. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that if you do shorter appointments, a lot of times there may be more appointments required to get everything done that needs to be done. Um, and if you are seeking treatment in a dental school setting, unfortunately, speed is not always our strong suit. One thing we always say is we're good, but we're not fast because we're teaching students to do dentistry, essentially, and they have to be checked at periodic uh, timeframes throughout the appointment. So um, in a dental school setting, you're not likely to have someone who can just get in and get out and get everything done that needs to be done. And then uh, lastly, using a hand mirror can help just to show the patient what's being done in their mouth while it happens. It can just kind of entice some curiosity and distract from all the other sensations happening and they can see exactly what it is that you're doing in the mouth. Uh, one question that came in through the poll ahead of time was, uh, how do you ask these types of things? Well, you should never feel afraid to ask for what you want or what will help you feel comfortable, whether that's in a dental office or in life in general. I mean, I think that full disclosure in a dental setting is probably the best way to go. Let your dentist know that you're a little nervous for the visit and they may or may not ask what they can do to accommodate you or make you feel comfortable. If they don't ask, um, all you have to do is simply ask, would it be possible to X, Y, Z? And you'd be surprised what a long way that will go. We have another video here. It's Stephanie's Day, an event we proudly host to provide help and resources for people with special needs. All types of resources there even help with medical needs. We're putting the spotlight on one group helping children with autism and other special needs when it comes to dental health. That's right. CBS 2's Jasmine Veal is live at Children's Hospital LA tonight to show us a program just for special needs children. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, you guys. So think about it. When you go to the dentist office, I mean, there's it's like sensory overload, the drills, the lights. Well, this is where a USC study is happening inside the Children's Hospital's dental clinic for children with autism. And it's where we met Jack and his mom, Carrie, who are proof that the research being done here is working. 
How are you, Ben? You doing okay? Dr. Jose Polito at Children's Hospital Los Angeles has been 12-year-old Jack Geary's dentist for the last six years. Did you pick the bubbles this time? Jack and his mom, Carrie, are now a part of a USC research study that hopes to change a typically scary dental experience for kids with autism into a happy one. Being part of this project has been a gift. Going to the dentist is tough enough for an adult, and having a child who can't navigate our world makes it 10 times worse. First thing we do is turn off the lights. Lucia Florendez, a PhD student with USC Science and Occupational Therapy Division, shows me how this dental exam room is different. There are blackout curtains on the window. Classical music is played through an iPod. Overhead, a projector displays a kaleidoscope of colors and other images. There's a Nemo hidden somewhere in there. The dental chair is outfitted in comfortable straps resembling butterfly wings. I think I like this part. You like the the butterfly blanket mm -hmm. that gives you a hug? Yeah. Each visit and reaction is recorded and analyzed. The idea is that more and more children will have good preventive care to minimize, you know, the times that they need to be in a hospital environment. He's comfortable and he's not fighting me to come in. He's not afraid. It's been amazing. So Jeff and Susie, there's a year left in the study, and then they hope to share those results with all dentists across the country. And by the way, they, they still need families to participate in this study. And of course, those families will get paid for their time. And you know how you can find out more. You guys have the information. Stephanie's Day, that's happening tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, anything to make it easier for them, Jasmine, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it is, as I mentioned, it is sensory overload. Any little yeah. thing can can set a child off. And of course, it is scary. It's all brand new to them. Sure. And this really seems to be working. It really is a good program, a good service, Absolutely. too, to these children. Yeah, Children's Hospital LA does amazing, yeah. tremendous things for children. To, Jasmine, thank you. To the children and their parents. Yes. Right? And just that It's Stephanie's day. And if so spoiler alert, um, this video is a few years old. So they did finish the study. And they found that these sensory calming features like lava lamp, dim colored variable lighting, aurora projectors, et cetera, um, do tend to help calm the brain um, when in a heightened sense of nervousness in an event like going to a dental office. Uh, our clinic doesn't have anything established like this yet, but we're looking into getting funding for a sensory room, getting that built into our clinic for patients with ASD. It's funny because I attended the SCDA conference this year in April, and they said that the offices that have added this sensory room, uh, it often ends up getting used more by the staff than it does the patients. So you don't have to have ASD to enjoy an experience like that. Um, and then the device that you see in the video uh, that they were wrapping him in, it's called a butterfly wrap. It's not a papoose or a restraining device. It's similar to a weighted blanket, and it just kind of gives the patient a big hug while still allowing them to move or adjust their position as needed. Restraining devices like the papoose are really only used for a handful of cases and a majority of those cases, if the patient, the patient will just walk right onto the papoose board and they'll lay down willingly without any direction um, because that is a sense of comfort for them. Although it is technically a restraining device in that they can't really move their arms and their legs. Um, some of our patients are just used to getting dental treatment in that way, but that's not something that we're using very routinely. And the few that do use it, like I said, it's just because that's how they've been conditioned and they literally just get up and walk into the papoose at their own accord. Um, so it, patients do consider it as comforting, but we aren't frequently using restraining devices, more devices that just help with comfort. So things that we do from a dental perspective that help our patients, and some of these you can incorporate to when you're helping your child at home with uh, brushing their teeth. And one of the main things is tell, show, do. This has been an age old trick and works in pediatrics too. We tell you what we're going to do. We show you how we'll do it and, the, and what we will use. And then we actually do what it is that we were describing. And this just, again, helps create a sense of familiarity to a brand new task. Um, occasionally we'll make referrals to a speech pathologist for children under the age of five if they present nonverbal and if this uh, avenue has not yet been explored. Uh, gaggers, someone had sent this question in, so I decided to add it to the slide at the last minute. Um, there are a number of things that we can try. We can try distracting the gag reflex, 
Sometimes when we're taking x-rays we'll, or taking impressions, we'll add a small pinch of salt to the tongue, just like, you know, just a small pinch of salt. Um, and it can actually distract the tongue um, and distract from the gag reflex. So you're thinking more about the salt and not about uh, wanting to gag in a sense. Um, and there are other tricks we can use too. Like sometimes we'll numb the roof of the mouth because that's often what activates the gag reflex. And if you can't feel anything aggravating it, um, then it's not going to trigger the reflex or other physical distraction techniques like um, deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, um, and different body exercises in the dental chair. Like sometimes if we're waiting for the impression to set, we'll have a patient try to lift one leg in the dental chair and meet their one heel to their opposite toe and then do the same thing with the other foot for those few minutes until the impression material sets. Um, so there are a lot of techniques that we can use. And then as a very last resort, if none of these are successful, we do do sedation. Um, just to kind of give you an overview, there are different levels of sedation that range from light sedation. So that just involves taking an anti-anxiety pill before coming to the appointment. Uh, we frequently use triazolam, but there are lots of drugs out there that um, could be used just to kind of calm in a sense, and the patient should still be able to walk and everything on their own, but it's just more so to kind of take the edge off or nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas. And this has also been known to help with gag reflexes. So sometimes uh, we'll put the nitrous mask on the patients if they're having trouble with x-rays or the gag reflex is really activating. Uh, nitrous can help with that. But um, laughing gas actually should not make the patient laugh. If the patient is laughing on it, then there may be a little bit too much. Again, it's really just meant to calm and kind of take the edge off. Um, and then, so what we can do if neither of those two single techniques, either the oral or the inhalation are working, we can try a combination of the two. And the advantage to nitrous is the minute we take the mask off, the sensation goes away. So if we feel like um, the patient's getting a little too relaxed, then we always have that option to remove the nitrous. And it's a very safe technique um, if done within, within the appropriate means. And then um, what we do in our clinic, we only go up to this fourth bullet point here, the IV deep sedation. Uh, we don't do general anesthesia in our clinic because the deeper you go, the greater the risk is to the patient. And we're an academic university, we're not a hospital. So um, we don't like to take the risk of doing general anesthesia. That's not to say that it's not available out there, but usually we stick to a level of deep sedation um, where the patient typically can't remember the treatment that happened or what was going on. Um, and it's kind of just like they went to sleep and woke up and got it all done, but they're still breathing on their own and their organs are still functioning on their own, which is the main distinguishment between deep sedation and general anesthesia. With general anesthesia, um, we're doing everything for you. Whereas with deep sedation, you still have to maintain an airway, uh, and be healthy enough to stay awake on your own or not stay awake, but keep your body functioning on your own. Um, and so it would depend on the patient's ability to tolerate various kinds of treatment and also the type of the procedure that's needed. Obviously, the more involved the procedure, such as a wisdom tooth extraction, the patient's going to be more likely to want to be at a deeper level of sedation. Um, and that's for anyone neurotypical or neurodivergent. We do deep sedation or, I mean, sometimes you see general anesthesia for uh, wisdom tooth extraction on neurotypical patients. So it just depends on the provider in the individual case. See if we can get this video to work. If not, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's just a little funny TikTok. No. Okay. It was just a little video that talked about treating yourself. So after the visit, um, positive reinforcement is a really, really helpful tool. Uh, I do this with myself even, and I guess my dog too, all the time with tasks that are not particularly exciting. Um, you know, it's for those chores or those things that you're really supposed to be doing, but you just aren't that naturally motivated. The idea is that you get a reward after doing the task so that you start to associate that thing uh, that you didn't want to do with something that you like, kind of like the Pavlovian dog response. Um, and going to the dentist definitely falls under that category of tasks that earn you the right to treat yourself after, uh, in case we have any Parks and Recs fans out there like me. But it can be something small like going out to eat, getting an ice cream cone, which I know seems counterintuitive after going to the dental office. 
um, or even just buying yourself a or your child a little toy, um, or it can be a surprise every time you go. But keep in mind that if you get a fluoride treatment at the dental office, which we often do after cleanings, so you'll just have to wait 30 minutes before eating or drinking anything. So, um, we can get your teeth clean, but it is imperative to develop and maintain good habits at home. So some supplies that you can purchase to help with dental care at home, uh, because every patient is different. These are just some items that have worked for some of our patients. And again, doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for you or your child, but just some suggestions that we've seen success on. A uh, spin brush or an electric toothbrush, that's a really big one. Uh, note that not everyone can tolerate this, especially right away. So I also lifted, listed the soft bristle toothbrush. Um, that's going to be what's best for your gums, the least aggravating to the patients. Uh, the softer, the better. A couple of my favorite brands are the Curaprox, which I think you can get at Target or on Amazon. Uh, or there's one that uh, made its way across TikTok that's called. Um, Dr. Splotka's, I believe, and it's called a flossing toothbrush. It's not meant to replace flossing, but it has these really fine bristles that can get into the really hard to reach areas without aggravating uh, the gums or the teeth or any sensory issues. Uh, fruit flavored toothpaste is a big hit. Uh, someone wrote in that their child doesn't like toothpaste and not necessarily because of its flavor, but more because of the texture. Um, well, I have good news for you. The toothpaste is not necessarily, um, it's not needed for adequate oral hygiene and it doesn't do much besides apply fluoride to your teeth. Uh, most of the action is done, but from the toothbrush itself. So we have some people that dry brush or some people that, um, get fluoride in mouth rinses, and then they just dip their toothbrush in the mouth rinse and brush with that. That's perfectly acceptable or just dry brushing and then supplementing with a fluoride rinse after. Um, some floss picks, which I'll talk about in a later slide. There's something called the Disney Magic Timer app that uh, it's an app that you download on your phone and there are certain toothbrushes that are compatible with it and it helps track your days of brushing and there's like little games you can play and coins you can earn. Um, and it's kind of just like a, an accountability checker to make sure they're staying on track with brushing their teeth and our patients have responded really well to that and they come and they show us their app and they're so pleased to see they've got, you know, 10 day streak of brushing twice a day. Uh, sometimes that can just help create a little bit of uh, external motivation. Um, or uh, there are some smart rinses or plaque disclosing rinses where the patient can rinse uh, and the rinse will actually stain whatever plaque or debris is in there, a pink or a blue color. And these are available in different flavors at any different stores, but then they have something visual to see what it is that they need to brush off because sometimes plaque is just white and it looks like the rest of the teeth. So it can be confusing to, um, it can be confusing for the patient to know what to brush, what not to brush. So these uh, smart rinses can kind of direct them to where they need to brush. Um, Colgate Total seems to be one that our patients are really not a fan of. Um, the word that gets thrown, allowed, thrown around a lot is spicy because um, that is one of the stronger toothpaste. So if your child or if you are one of those people that don't like strong minty tasting uh, toothpaste, I would avoid something like Colgate Total. And Crest Sparkle is a really good one for a good fruit flavored toothpaste. Here are some of the supplies that we talked about. We have the electric toothbrush on the left, the standard manual, floss, um, these are the floss picks, or we call them slingshot flossers. Uh, they're acceptable, but um, I prefer string floss, and I'll kind of elaborate on that in a little bit. But just kind of a friendly reminder, we should all be brushing two times a day, ideally once in the morning, once at night, and flossing once per day. Uh, electric toothbrushes are always more effective than manual, but a lot of the issue is sensory toler being able to tolerate it from a sensory standpoint. Um, so some people can never graduate on to electric. Some people, uh, will buy little eight to $10 electric toothbrushes and that are just kind of disposable that are kind of a hybrid between regular and electric and work your way up to a full on electric toothbrush. And there are certain kinds that are a little more quiet and less aggressive than others that I would probably recommend. Um, 
that, like I said, the string floss is the best, but I will take a slingshot flosser over nothing. The issue with the, the slingshot floss is that we tend to take this little piece here and just jab, jab, jab in between every single tooth, but you want to make sure that you're really intentional with hugging the tooth next to it and hugging the tooth next to it so that you're not blunting that triangular piece of gum that sits in between the teeth because that acts as a protector. And if uh, that is eliminated from flossing too aggressively, it can cause um, food traps and cavities and potential tooth loss. So you have to be really careful if you are using them and make sure that you use them in the right way. And then on the right here, we have an open wide mouth rest and we use these a lot in the clinic, uh, more so the thinner one on the left because one advantage to it is you can insert it into the patient's mouth from the side so it's not um, opening too aggressively and then turn the mouth prop on the side so that you can do an exam. But, and these are made out of a soft styrofoam. So they're really atraumatic and it just helps the patient stay open and give something to rest on so that they don't have to do the work of staying open for you and you're not at risk of the patient closing on you. But you wanna be careful with these if you do come across them because multiple uses can actually cause the styrofoam to weaken and you don't want a piece of that to snap off and go into the airway. Um, one quick video here regarding home care. Um, but beforehand, I just want to say if your child is just starting out with brushing, it's best to start with the gloved finger method, like we talked about staying on the outside of the teeth, um, and cleaning teeth at home can be challenging. We know, and we recognize that, but this woman's a hygienist and I just want to show you her technique here. Hi, I'm Natalie, and I'm lucky enough that I have two kids with special needs. They both have autism, and brushing is a challenge, obviously. Um, and I, my son is 15, and my daughter is almost four. And uh, sometimes it's really hard to brush their teeth. And I want to talk about that because it's called desensitizing. You have to get in their mouth and do it nonstop, at least twice a day, to really make it work. So I'm going to show, oh, look at my daughter. She's doing a good job brushing now. Normally that's not the case, but I'm going to actually be brushing her teeth today. And my son used to act just like her. She was usually crying, and screaming during brushing. Oh, look, she's all done. No, she's not. Um, but Clint's going to show what a good job he does now. I'm going to show how I actually brush her teeth at home. Really. Let's do the top teeth first. Good job. This is just called desensitizing, brushing her teeth over and over again. Eventually, she'll end up just like Clint with no problem. It'll be really easy. You can do it. One more time. Good job. And you've done it. You've got a clean job. When Glenn was little, he was actually worse than Roslyn. I remember one time he hid. He ran from the bathroom and hid underneath the kitchen table. I had to drag him out and brush his teeth. But now look at him. He does a great job. He does his two minutes of brushing. He's had orthodontics. He's got his braces off. He's got a permanent retainer. He flosses his teeth. So in the beginning, it's really, really hard, like with Roslyn, but eventually we'll get there. Each day, some days are good, some days are bad. But now I can always count on Clint to do a good job. I still always double check his teeth to make sure he's done a good job. So brush away, don't give up, and we'll get there, right, Rosie? So because patients with a ASD are at a much greater risk of getting cavities, home care is super important. Um, sometimes we'll prescribe a prescription toothpaste that has higher fluoride content to help remineralize um, and prevent any cavities. And you will likely need to help your kids brush uh, maybe until they learn to do it or even throughout their lifetime, like you saw um, this woman still helps her adult child with brushing. Um, and if you're able to get them to the point of getting them a spin brush, it's good to bring that with to the appointments. Cause if that's what they're used to having in their mouth, we can even use that to clean their teeth or use that on one side while we're doing the exam on the other. Um, so a lot of ways, a lot of ways that we can help this population here. But I have to say, this woman in the video is a superwoman. I mean, she's a seasoned hygienist, so I can really appreciate her skill set. 
But we also have to acknowledge that she likely has a higher motivation to do this with her kids than the average person, given that she brushes teeth for a living. Um, I know how hard it is, you guys, whether you're a person with ASD, a parent, caregiver, or a loved one, I know that brushing can be challenging. And we have some patients who absolutely cannot brush at all. I mean, throughout their lifetime, it's just not a skill that they've learned. And no matter how much we try, they can't tolerate it. So they come to our clinic for cleanings once a month. Um, we have parents of patients who can only brush their teeth when their child is sitting down, going to the restroom and they open the door and they go in and they brush their child's teeth as quickly as possible. And then they get out. And the reason I tell you this is because I understand that sometimes with this population, br brushing can seem like torture. And I know it's not as easy as some of these people make it look, but what I want to drive home is that this is something, something is always better than nothing. Even if you're using floss picks over string floss or a manual over an electric, doing something is always going to be better than doing nothing. Uh, and if it's going to be the easiest thing that they'll tolerate, I mean, we'll take what we can get. Um, another thing to try is the water flosser, um, which I think I have a slide of uh, coming up here. And um, you can also appreciate in this video how she stands behind her kid and brushes just like if she's brushing her own teeth. Um, and I know that we're running a little short on time and I want to make sure I allow you guys enough time for questions too, but I'm happy to stay on a little bit after if there's uh, more than what we have time to answer, if that's okay with uh, Dominique. But um, on the left, we have a basic water flosser with a cord. And on the right, we have a cordless water flosser. I prefer these on the right just because um, what patients don't like about the water flossers is they can tend to get messy and drip water everywhere and all over the sink. But if you have a cordless flosser, you can actually take this into the shower with you and just kind of, as you're washing everything else, just kind of blast this through the gums and the teeth. Uh, then it won't make as much of a mess because you're already in the shower and everything's getting wet anyway. Um, but please, please, I need to emphasize, do not take this one that plugs into the wall, into the shower with you. Um, we don't need anybody getting injured or electrocuted from just trying to clean their teeth. Here are the references that are used. And now I'm going to open it up to the group for any questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Yenneman. That was really helpful and informative. And you know, based on, on some of the questions and comments I saw coming in, it seems like everyone, everyone feels the same way. So thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. And uh, I, I to your point just a moment ago, I think it's okay if we run a couple minutes over just so we can answer maybe maybe three or so questions. Uh, one one thing I want to start things off with that came through quite a bit was, um, I, as I'm sure you're aware, things like anesthesia and other dental procedures can be expensive. Um, are you aware of any groups or grants that may help with those expenses? Um, you know, not really on a national level. A lot of that is state by state dependent. So I like for us in Arizona, the funding changes almost yearly or every few years. There was a period of time where our patients got a, only a thousand dollars a year of benefits from the state, which doesn't even cover a single sedation visit. Um, but recently in our state, they've upped it to 4,500. So a lot of what you can do is actually petitioning at a governmental level to get more funding for these patients, um, particularly adults without any intellectual disability. I don't know what it's like in any of your home states, but that's one area that at least in Arizona is really lacking. Um, say if they just have ASD, uh, if they don't have an intellectual disability that accompanies it, they don't qualify for care. Um, so some of our patients that have been in those circumstances, I've seen them start GoFundMes or certain, like our school specifically will do certain cases if there's a lot of need and a lot of work that needs to be done and just no means to afford it. Um, we can do like a teaching case once a year where the school will actually fund their treatment for them. Um, and some dental schools do have programs like that. And by going to get treatment in a dental school, you'd be more likely to get connected with people who have grants, but I don't know of anything specifically on a national level that can cover for this. A lot of this would just be state by state trying to um, petition at your government to get more funding for these patients because there clearly is a need uh, and these patients really could benefit from that. Great. And um, I know we sort of ended on the at-home care with toothbrushing and just in the last couple of minutes, I got an we got an influx of questions, uh, a little bit more about toothbrushing. Uh, a couple things that I saw come in. 
uh, I'll just kind of lump it together. Is it harmful for to swallow toothpaste and how can parents teach or encourage their children to spit out the toothpaste rather than swallow it? And then another common one that came in was about alternatives to actual toothpaste, such as like a toothpaste tablet and what your thoughts are on something like that. Um, you know, you have to do what works for your child. If they're more likely to tolerate a toothpaste tablet, um, by all means, we can do that. But like I had mentioned, toothpaste is not what does the majority of the work. It's actually the mechanical removal of the plaque from the toothbrush itself. So you can dip into some Listerine. Uh, there are certain toothpastes that are okay to be swallowed in small amounts. That prescription toothpaste that I was talking with the thousand parts per million fluoride that we'd have to give to you, that one cannot be swallowed because I'm sure, I know there's a lot of uh, back and forth and a lot of debate on whether fluoride is toxic, but it's when ingested in large amounts. So if you have a child or a loved one that might eat a lot of toothpaste, that wouldn't be something that we would recommend for them because it can lead to toxicity if you're consuming it in that large of amounts. But the standard over-the-counter toothpaste, um, I mean, obviously I wouldn't go eat a whole tube of them, but if you're just swallowing a little bit here and there, that's not going to cause any harm. Um, and then to your point about, you know, dry brushing and, and really the actual brushing of the teeth being even more important than the use of toothpaste. How can you, if you have someone who's totally fine brushing their teeth, but maybe is a really hard brusher, um, doesn't, and, and like applies too much pressure, are there any, is there any advice or ways that you can um, think of to maybe help parents remedy that? Yeah, so I guess this would apply to uh, the population as a whole, not just people with ASD, because <laughs> we see that so often in the dental office where people just think they need to brush, brush, brush so hard. Um, but really all you need are those small gentle circles with a soft bristle brush along the gum line. Um, if you brush too hard, it can cause recession or it can cause damage to your actual enamel. So uh, a lot of electric toothbrushes, the fancier ones will have um, they'll have pressure sensors in them and they'll kind of buzz at you if you're brushing too hard. And I highly recommend those or just using a really soft bristle brush. Um, one thing I want to add to that is what I hear a lot from our patients with ASD specifically is that, uh, well, I don't like to brush because my gums bleed. And so I think it's a problem. Well, um, they're bleeding because they're aggravated. And the more you brush, the less they're going to bleed. But a lot of times we see people, they go in and they touch their gums with a toothbrush and it instantly bleeds. And so they stop right away. Um, the idea is that you want to brush more and then use kind of an antibacterial rinse to clean everything out at the end. Um, I really like the alcohol-free Listerines, the standard Listerine or ACT, you know, anything over the counter, but the standard that has alcohol in it, um, again, it can be really spicy and strong flavored. So I recommend sticking to the alcohol-free or the fruit flavored um, or the ones that can stain the plaque. And then that way they know exactly where they're going and what they need to brush off. Great. That's helpful. Helpful for me. Um, and then one, I think one last question that uh, goes back to sort of making, making accommodations. You were talking about how there's some, um, you can do like a private room for, for patients, but are there any alternatives to the actual exam chair itself? So if somebody has an issue with, you know, the, the reclining backwards sensation or just even laying down, are there accommodations that can be made and what could people ask for to have those accommodations made? So we have some different um, supplies that probably aren't available in other offices, but we have what's called a backpack. And it's actually a big beanbag chair for our patients, like if they're positioned in a really kyphotic position, or if that sensation of being in, in the chair is too overwhelming, it's a big beanbag that we wrap around into them in whatever position they want to be. And then we actually hook it up to the suction and then it sucks all the air out, kind of like one of those storage bags that makes everything really compact. Um, so that can accommodate and kind of create a hug-like sensation, or um, we talked about the butterfly wrap. Um, we can, some patients have issues with reclining the chair back. So um, for some patients, they'd rather we have the chair reclined and then they just get into the reclined chair. Um, again, it's not really a one size fits all, but it would depend on what the issue is. 
and um, what works best for the patient. But there are a different number of modalities that we can try if that is uncomfortable. Great, and I know I said that was the last question, but there's one more that I think that came in quite a bit. I think it is really important. Um, just to clarify, these accommodations, can, can they be made for autistic adults as well? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, these apply to everyone. Um, and in general, kind of what I was referring to is both children and adults. So unless I specified throughout the lecture, pretty much everything that I talked about, because um, our clinic actually is special needs adults predominant. We have a separate pediatric clinic that will work with children with ASD. And then we collaborate for cases when sedation is needed. But um, pretty much all of these apply to adults with special health care needs as well.